open up the multiple cases that I have to Calgary County and try to figure out like where where people went wrong. But the thing is, you you end up um, the people that will help you won't go up against like anybody downtown. Um, so you run into this issue of people trying to tell you what you need to do, but not having the funding to actually do it. And then, you know, like f for, um, all right, where, where, where can I start? Um, all right, so basically, um, I've been getting in trouble since I was like 13, 14, okay? All of my original cases from even juvenile has came through um, first and second district police department in mm -hmm. Cleveland. Um, originally, when I was locked up as a juvenile, I think I did almost about three years. And um, during that time, this was around like 98, um, I dealt with some of the same uh, detectives and officers that I, I dealt with through Oh, my really? adult uh, years. And, um, during this point in time, my judge was Judge Ferrari. This is when you were in juvenile? Yeah. Okay. Who was kicked off the bench for sending juveniles to, del to jail and start and oh, taking really? kickbacks. So I couldn't get anybody to open up this case because it's kind of like hush hush. You know, so, and I hadn't realized this until, you know, a few years ago. So um, when I uh, got out of juvie, um, it was like 38 days from my 18th birthday, you know, um, got into a little more trouble. Um, I, um, got sent back to, uh, to, uh, the juvenile detention center for about like six months. And then eventually they straight released me. Mm -hmm. and, um, then, um, I got sent to the workhouse for a while and I was there for about, uh, four or five months. And then, um. Eventually, I caught uh, my drug trafficking charges, which was through um, first and second district. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the same detectives that um, gave me my drug trafficking charges also popped up down it throughout the cases. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so in your in your twenties, um, nineteen, in your early nineteen, okay. okay. So, what was your date of birth, by the way? Two twenty six eighty three. Two twenty six eighty three. Okay. Um, it's because it's a common name. I wanted to make sure that we Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so when I was 19, um, I was stopped by um, second district detectives. Um, they asked me to come over to the car. I did. So this is, is this the, the case that... No, oh, no. So this is a previous, an earlier case. Yeah. Um, I have um, two drug trafficking charges from about 13 years ago when okay. I was 19, um, where I was, the drugs was actually planted on me or not even, I wouldn't even say planted on me. Um, basically I was walking down the street. I was called to the detective's car. I walked over. There is a white guy in the back of the car. He said, is this the guy that sold it to you? They said, yeah. And then they arrested me. I went to jail. I sat for 72 hours. They straight released me. And then I hadn't heard anything else about the case. Eventually, I get an indictment. I start going to court for it. Um, my public defender tell me that you know there's no witnesses. No witnesses. They couldn't figure out where the drugs had went to. Um, and you hadn't sold to that guy. No. And they actually found the drugs on him. Mm -hmm. So. Um, during that time, um, my public defender told me to go with a bench trial, which I had no idea really what it was, but he told me that they would kick everything out because there was no witness and no evidence. And um, I was sent to Mansfield that day. When I got in front of the judge at the time, which was Chris Boyko, um, I tried to explain to him, you know, what the public defender had said, exactly what had went on. And he told me that, um, you know, based on the detectives that pulled me over, you know, that's what the outcome was. And I was pretty much sent to Mansfield for my first offense on less than one-tenth of a gram of cocaine. You know, that wasn't even filed on me. Um, in, in between that time, 
they had picked me up again, hit me with another drug trafficking charge. Um, and the equivalent of the two drug trafficking charges, both was less than one tenth of a gram of trafficking. I ended up with five felons from both of them. You know, so I was hit with trafficking, preparation to sell, criminal tools, you know, and all these lists of charges. Um, I went to Mansfield and um, eventually realized, like, you know, I needed to do something. Um, so I started doing the GED there. When I was released from there, um, I got in touch with uh, BVR, which is a program for people with disabilities. And um, they sent me to VGS to start doing trades. Um, and I did uh, basic electrician and plumbing and carpentry. Um, once I finished there, um, I um, went through the GED program, finally got my GED, and then I started at Tri-C. Um, it was about my third or fourth semester at Tri-C. Um, I had started uh, the Clean Out Kings, which is our company. Um, and um, I used to hold uh, video game tournaments down towards like uh, Lorraine and some of the, you know, like more urban areas. I got a lot of young family down there. So when I started doing it, it was just to try to get some of my family to stay off the street or whatever. But it turned into like this thing where, you know, we would have, you know, 16, 20 people playing at a time. And we just, you know, get some snacks, and that's what we would do. Um, one day I was coming for it from uh, one of the events at my uh, cousin's house. And, um, I seen, because um, at the time I was staying in Brooklyn, so um, I seen um, the detectives fly past me with their lights on. So, you know, they're going the opposite way of me. And it's about two lanes of traffic. So, you know, I look, the light turns green. I turn. Now I see that they're behind me, about two cars. So I'm thinking like, well, now they're harassing somebody else, you know, and I keep going. I see the uh, two cars go around me, you know, so, you know, I pull over or whatever. And um, the detective uh, get out of the car and he goes, um, he goes, um, well, what are you doing? And I go, I go, what do you mean? And he go, um, he go, what are, what are you doing? And I go, I go, nothing, I'm going home. I go, what do you mean? Um, and at that time, he looked at me and then sucker punched me. And then um, I'm like, really? And, and then now I'm kind of leaning over in my vehicle towards the passenger seat. And I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? And he like, um, he like, um, he like shut your car off. And I'm like, you just, you just sucker punched me. And I go, I go, you really want me to shut the car off? And he's like, he's like, shut the car off. And I'm like, and then he was like, um, he's like, shut the car from get, uh, and give me a license or whatever. So I'm like, okay. Um, before, as soon as I shut the car off, he started walking back. I don't even think he grabbed my license. By the time he got back, uh, he took a few steps. And by the time he did that, he turned around and reached for my door and yanked it open. Well, at the time, I had a, a 92 Buick Regal. And uh, the car seatbelt is actually connected to the door. So when he yanked it that fast, it automatically activated the seatbelt and it stopped and jerked back. Once that happened, I reached and I, um, I locked the door and I go, what are you doing? And he was like, you need to get out of the car or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm not getting out of the car. And he's like, you need to unlock the door. And I'm like, no. And then he reached in and punched me again. And I'm trying to lean back over into the passenger seat. Now, by now, by now, the other detective that was in the car is 
is trying to uh, reach for me too and was able to like pull me over my window. So now I'm in my seat though, in my car, and I'm over a portion of my window. And um, they got my arm out the door and he just punching me in my face. And then um, I can see the other detective move around the car and then try to start tapping at the, uh, the window with his gun or whatever. And, um, with his gun? Yeah. Like hitting, tapping the window with his gun. I don't know if he was trying to break it or... or Was it forcefully or sort of tapping to scare you with the gun? It was like tapping. Like he could have broke it. I'm pretty sure if he wanted to. Like, you know, I, I really wasn't sure exactly what he was what he was really doing for real. Wow. And the way that they had me, like I can only see a portion because this part of my body was actually over the window, even though my seatbelt was still on. And that's as far as they could pull me because of the seatbelt being on me. Um, eventually, I don't know how long this went on, but I, I, I can remember him, the, the other detective that was tapping on the window, coming back, hitting me a couple times, and then he'll go back to the car trying to like jerk the other doors open. Um, eventually, um, it seemed like I heard I heard sirens coming, so I I I was like, okay, eventually, you know, this has got to stop eventually. When um, the other police got there, I was still in my seatbelt in my car, outside the the window, um, kind of like on this side, with my arm, both of my arms out like this. And, um, the officer was holding you, pulling, yeah. trying to pull you out of the car? Basically, they was just holding me after a while. They they stopped really trying to necessarily pull me. It was just them holding my arms like this and just punching me in my face. Just nonstop laughing about it like it was a game. And I remember hearing the sirens and thinking, like, finally, like, you know, they're going to have to stop. And then um, once the police pulled up, I can remember looking up and seeing that it, um, it was actual officers there in uniform. And I told them, I go, I wasn't resisting. I go, they beat me up. I go, I wasn't doing anything. And um, that was when the detective uh, told him, yeah, he resisted. And that's when the other officer put out the taser and they tased me in my armpit four times and was laughing about it. And, um, Eventually, um, the rest of the officers got there at some point, and they pulled me out the car. Uh, um, you know, he asked me, like, where's the drugs at? I go, I don't have no drugs. I go, I, I had told the officer at one point, you know, that I had a little bit of weed on me. I go, I got a little bit of weed on me. I go, that's it. You know, I, I go, I go, that's it. And um, he was like, no, I'm not no weed. He was like, where's the dope at? And I go, I don't have any dope. I go, I told them that, and I, I'm telling you the same thing. I'm like, there's no dope in my car for real. You know what I'm saying? And they was ripping the car apart. They destroyed it, ripped the wires out, just just destroyed it. And they was like, and they kept coming to me like, where's the dope? And I kept telling them, I go, there is no dope in my car. I go, you can test me. I go, I didn't touch dope in years for real. I go, you know, I go, I, I've been telling you that. And that was when, um, you know, I told him that, um, I go, I want to speak to a supervisor. And I go, as soon as you take me downtown, I'm telling what y'all did for real. And then um, the one uh, detective told me, he like, oh, yeah, you can say what you want to, but I'll see you again or whatever. And then he took his gun like, oh, yeah, I'll see you again. He like, what you think you're going to do for real? He like, I'll, I'll catch up with you like that. And I'm like, you know. I'm like, it don't matter. I go, I'm telling as soon as I get down here. And so I asked them to call the EMS. And for a while, they wouldn't. And then I remember uh, the supervisor coming, which was a lady named Officer Coleman. And um, she was like, so where's the dope at? And I go, I keep telling y'all that I have no dope. I go, you know, I go, I don't even know why he originally put me over for real. I got was coming from my cousin's house. I make it a point not to stop anywhere or to talk to anybody while I'm in motion because they like to use that name as an excuse to just pull you over and harass you. I go, you know, I go, I don't, I don't even know why they did it. I go, I go, I've had this car for 10 years. You know, I go, so it running me. 
I go, so, you know, I don't know, I really don't know what's going on, but I don't have any dope. And um, I go, and I didn't resist. I go, they just basically started beating me up for no reason. And she's just like, whatever, you know, we'll find the dope or whatever or something like that. And I'm like, well, I'm like, somebody need to do something about this. And she was like, it's, she was like, well, she's like, we'll see. And then she took a couple pictures and that was it. Was this at the scene or yes, at the station? This was at the scene. And so eventually, you know, I tell her like, you know, I need to, um, I need a paramedic or whatever. When the paramedics come, cause I still had the, the tasers under my arm in my armpit. When the paramedics come, they don't really care what's going on. I'm trying to tell them what's going on. And somebody yanked the tasers off and under my arm and say he resists the medical when they leave. And that wasn't true that you that you said no, no. To, the, to medical help? No. And then um, I remember um, at that point... How were you feeling physically? I, you know, at one point I remember thinking to myself while they was hitting me that you know, like eventually, you know, as long as I just stop resisting, you know, and not, not try to fight them or nothing, you know, that eventually they'll stop. But I thought they was about to kill me for real. Like, I thought that was it. You know, and, um, you know, I didn't think they was going to stop. And then when originally when I, I remember hearing that um, backup had called them or something, I remember them telling them, that they didn't need any backup or whatever. So I knew right then and there that I was on my own. And at the time I was yelling and screaming because it's, it's like 3.30 or so in the afternoon and this is a busy street and I'm screaming at people that's driving by to call the police, call the police. You know what I'm saying? And they're laughing like we are the police, ha, ha, ha. Were these officers in plain clothes? Or yes, okay. these was detectives. You know, um, and, um, somehow... Somebody did see what was going on and started contacting my family or whatever. Um, and I, I didn't know that at the time, but, um, you know, after after um, Officer Coleman took the picture, they started taking me downtown. And the whole time we was going downtown, basically, you know, I was telling them that, you know, as soon as I get somewhere to tell you, I go, I'm telling you, I go, this makes no sense for real. You know what I'm saying? I go, I go, I haven't done nothing. I go out of all the people, you know, that that has been in trouble before. I wanted a few people that still try to go down there. I still try to get people employed. You know, the company that we run is basically it, the reason why I started is because I couldn't get hired anywhere. You know, and I wanted to help people have something to look forward to, you know, so that they can do something, you know. So... You know, like, this was just, like, to me, this was, like, well, you know, I go to school, you know, I go to get my trades, I try to start a business, you know, I stay out of the way, I stay away from, you know, the drugs and all the people that's involved in it, and then I can still be beat by the police, they can still take me to court for it, you know, I mean, it was a lot of things running through my mind at the time, you know, but, um, once we got downtown to the Justice Center and we got there, you know, I told the people there, I go, I need to speak to a supervisor. I go, they just beat me up for no reason. And then I hadn't realized that I looked the way I did. And a lady looked at me and she was like, oh my God. And my face was just deformed at this, this point for real. They had beat me and the whole underarm of mine was like green and swole down to almost midway in my stomach. And, um, I can't remember a whole lot from there to uh, when they had to send me out to Metro because something happened or I just, I just remember Dan waking up in Metro and, um, being handcuffed to the bed and it being two other officers there. And, um, not the ones who had no, abused you. No, um, have anxiety attacks and I think maybe I, I had anxiety attack and if they are bad enough then I'll pass out mm -hmm. and I just remember um, just waking up on the bed at Metro and um, I'm not even sure what test they ran or exactly what happened 
you know, um, but, you know, I know that Metro was lenient in actually doing anything about it, you know, because it just seemed like it was, you know, like they just didn't care. So they sent me back to the hospital probably, you know, after like eight hours, they sent me back to uh, the county. and um, To the jail. To the county jail. And I remember um, at some point a guard come in and check on me and asked me if I was all right. And I'm like, what's wrong? And I looked and all my clothes were just soaked and I was just shivering. And he like, what's wrong? And I'm like, man, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, it could be a panic attack. I'm like, but it's never done this before. And um, he was like, well, you know, he like come out. And he like, and, um, he like, let me see if I can get somebody to, uh, you know, look at you or whatever. And, you know, he was asking me, he was like, you know, are you coming off any drugs? I go, no, I go, you know, I go, I smoke cigarettes. I go, I don't drink. I go, I don't, I don't know what's happening for real. You know, and, um, I got rushed back out to Metro again. And, um, you know, I was there for almost a day or so. I, I, I can't remember. And then when I came back to um, the uh, county jail again, I had court like the next day or something. And then um, I was released on bond. And then, you what know. What were you charged with? Um, at first, they charged me with not using a blinker. Uh, um, then they tried to charge me with um, obstruction of justice. They tried to charge me with resisting arrest at one point. This kind of went on through court for like um, a little over a year. And them trying to actually just charge me with something. And so, I mean, yeah. using not using a blinker, they can't arrest you on that, and they did. That's you know, and like, and that was that was the problem. And what what aggravates me is you run into this issue with you not having enough money or you not having, you know, enough resources to support you. And so, you know, you know, I was lucky to have like a, a decent support system for real, of people who know that I've been trying to you know, do good for years now, you know, so they, you know, got money together for me to get a, a criminal attorney, you know, but it wasn't the criminal attorney who actually looked through stuff. It was the judge who got tired of seeing what was going on, and she's trying to figure out why is this case still being drugged through, you know, when it makes no sense for real, you know, so really, you know, it was the judge who had decided, like, look, you know, like, this this has to be dismissed. Like you can't. There's no charges to charge him, you know. And then after that, um, we started going through um, the civil suit. Um, but you know, um, our company has been working for the Cleveland Public Schools for you know almost five years now. You know, so a lot of our work is in the center in a, in the inner city area where you run into the police. And so, you know, I would see the same detectives as I'm going through this case, giving me the finger and waving at me, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, we would be on the property and for a while, you know, I would have to take multiple people on the properties with me just so that it would be safe because we would be doing a property and we come around a corner and it's a Cleveland police officer sitting there when CMSD has their own police for real. You know, and I can't tell him to leave for real. I don't know if he's sitting there because he's trying to, you know, stop crime or if he's sitting there because, you know, I don't know. You know, but for me, it's like, well, I have to run my business because this is how I support myself. You know, so, you know, this, this is something that to this day still goes on, you know, and, you know, there's nobody to really do anything about it, you know. It sounds like before this happened to you, you had some distrust of the police anyway. And did it? do you feel like you distrust the police more because this happened? Oh, most definitely. You know, um... How, how did this affect the way you feel about your general safety overall and especially your relationship or, or your, your thinking of how the police are supposed to be and how they behave in general? You know, um... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, when when you grow up in the in in the areas and the environments that I grew up in, 
it's an acceptance that since you're doing the wrong thing, that the police can beat you up. And people accept that. Like, oh, you know, I was doing the wrong thing, so, you know, he beat me up. And, and that's just the way it goes, you know. But, you know, when you are trying to do the right thing and you are trying to move forward and it still happens, you know, like it's, 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 it's hard to stay focused, you know. And, it's, you know, as far as the police go, you know, um, I remember, um, you know, when a supervisor um, that was an African-American appeared on the scene after everything was said and done. And I told him, I go, I go, they beat me up or whatever. You know, and you expect for somebody of color to be able to relate to you a little more and to tell you like, all right, well, you know, I don't, at least I don't know what's going on here, but I'm going to look into it. And, you know, that wasn't the thing, you know, so, you know. Did he say that to you? He said the 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 thing what he told me was is that you had dope on you. And I go, What a little weed? And he like it's still illegal. You know, so you know you Cleveland police, you know, and, and what has been going on there for years now, you know, no, nobody trusts the police out there and it doesn't matter if you black and white. And and this 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 racist tear that they have down there is something that's been going in the city for a long time for real. You know, and it is a black and white thing, but it's really it's really bigger than that for real. You know, and nobody feels safe. I have a lot of white friends. You know, I have a friend that stay in Bay Village. I have a friend that, you know, are 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 wealthy and they stay in Medina, you know. When they would come out to Euclid when I stayed out there and they would try to visit me, they would get pulled over and harassed. You know, like, it, 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 even though it is a racist thing, it, it needs to be a thing where people just follow the laws. And the people that are supposed to serve us and protect us, whether they be police officers or detectives or judges or whoever they may be, should be held to a higher standard and not a lower standard than everybody else. You know, and that's what's dividing everything. No, you can't trust police. And if you're on the east side of Cleveland, they're not showing up. You have to protect yourself. You know, and, you know, we do a, we do a lot of abandoned properties for the schools. You know, so, you know, if we have an incident where something happens, we're on our own for real. Now, we can call CMSD. They'll show up, you know, when they can or whatever. But, you know, the, the Cleveland police, being being a homeowner or somebody who has to stay on the east side and depend on the police, you are on your own. You know, so that's where the dividing is coming because they're supposed to help. They're supposed to protect you. But when you call them, they're not there. They're supposed to help and supposed to protect you, but they do things like beat you up when they stop you for no reason. You know, so, no, I don't I don't trust the police. And I hope to God they never put me over for, you know, nothing at all because I know that if they could, they probably would have killed me that day. You know, I know that. And I know that the more aggravated they get, you know, the more that they're reprimanded for what they do, you know, they will retaliate because they always have. The reason why I am where I am now is because... When this happened, it was a lot of other things going on where they were going into people's houses after people press charges and make statements on them and charge them with weird cases and pull them out of their house. So, you know, my goal was to move out of the county to where somewhere where I would be safe. And at least if something did happen, there would be no reason for them to be out this way. You know, but, you know, once... Um, we went through the criminal procedure of the case and was able to get it dropped. I um, started realizing that some of the same detectives that charged me as um, for my first felony charges were involved on this case. Matter of fact, the detective, one of the detectives that beat me up, radioed to one of the detectives that planted cases on me. You know, and 
when they did that, you know, I don't know what was said out of it, but this was bef this was during the fact of them beating me up. You know, so once this actually goes to the court for the civil suit, I go in front of the same judge that sent me to Mansfield for no evidence, which was Chris Boyko, who was the federal judge now. You know, and I was trying to tell them, like, you know, like, this, to me, this makes no sense for real, you know. And, you know, like, I already feel like I was wrong by the judge in the first place and that he didn't look at the evidence that was available. And now I have to go in front of him to explain to him that I was beat up by the same district again, for real. You know, and, you know, he wouldn't talk to me. I didn't feel like, you know, he, he took it as serious as it was. You know, and in the end, I was told that the police don't get in trouble. The only thing you can do is get money out of it. You know, and when it was all said and done, I felt that if I kept pushing and I kept going on with it, that something would probably happen to me eventually. You mean there would be some retaliation? Most definitely. You know, I have, um, you know, three properties in their districts on the west side of Cleveland that I have to work, you know, um, for me at that point, I mean, I thought that that was the best way to just not, not cause any more problems. Um, now that I look at it and, and the way, the way it's set up is they kind of convince you that you're not going to be able to fight them. You don't have enough money to fight them. You know, they're all going to lie and say that you did something, you know, and so you're convinced to back down and turn tail because if you don't, they're going to win, you know, and this has been what has been going on in the city for so long for real. You know, like I still deal, you know, with a lot of issues that that come from this real you know um you know um, um to me um i'm hoping that uh people start understanding that if 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 it's not stopped if they don't do anything about it then it, it does f re flow over to different suburban areas. It does affect people who may not have to be in the inner city or live in the inner city for real. You know, like the 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 whole setup, the way everything is set up now is we we take care of the people that we can relate to, you know, and, and that's where we cause more problems for real, you know. We create monsters by not giving them a way to move forward, you know, by constantly, you know, judging them on things that happen, you know, in their in our past. You know, if 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 you have nothing to work forward to, and if they tell you you can't do anything, and if you're labeled, then what do you do? And you know, this is this is the problem that we're running into now. You know, and now people are seeing, okay, well, if we release felons, which we will have to eventually, and we don't get them educated, and we can't get them work, and they can't find housing, they're going to steal from them. They are going to sell drugs. They are going to rob stores for real. You know, like, you know, we have we have no, no, no plan or anything in place for anything whatsoever for real at this point. You know, and, and dealing with the police and the way things are set up is, is part of the problem for real. You know, because since they are allowed to pay and cover up and intimidate, the real story is not being being told by anybody. And so when you get to areas where, you know, you talk about, you know, Medina and, you know, Bay Village and some of the upper class areas where they've never seen anybody actually, you know, wronged by the police for real. It's hard for them to understand that this is really going on for real, you know? So, but them are the people who are going to stand up and actually help them be able to push things forward for real, but they can't relate to that. They don't think it's real, you know? So, you know, like, like we, 
I mean, we need to come together and start doing something, you know. Do you think that the, the Department of Justice report that was released recently really laid out all of a lot of cases that they heard about through the community? Do you think that the fact that the federal government has now kind of stepped in, that that is a major step toward what you're talking about? Do you think that finally someone will force change? Um, I'm hoping so. Um, you know, uh, it's possible, but you know, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, I guess. You know, you know, we've been having the same people in control of things down there for a while, and you know, especially in Cuyahoga County, you know, and um. You know, it's it's like the thing with, you know, Jimmy Damore and all, all of them for real. You know, if you pull one person, you know, then everybody fall. You know, because it's been going on so long that it's, it's, it's I, I don't know. I, I, it's I, part of the culture there. Yeah, like, you know, and it's accepted for real. You know, um, yeah, I don't know. Amanda, anything that you, uh, any questions or thoughts you have or anything? No, I'm just, I'm so sorry to hear all this. Um, Thank you so much for, for talking with us. Very powerful. And it takes courage to do it, and I really appreciate it. Well, I'm hoping that it sheds some type of light on what's going on, because yeah. right now, um, Things are kind of messed up for real, and there's no way we can move forward without actually uniting. It's not, it's not, um, you know, just black kids dying or just police dying. And when we talk about the issue, we shouldn't segregate it into categories for real. You know what I'm saying? It should be innocent lives lost, whether they be blue, black, purple. It doesn't matter for real. You know, and the more we hold everybody accountable. You know, the more we can kind of fish out the people who can be helped and the people who can't be, you know, um, you know, like, I think that's that's one of the things that really bother me the most now. Like, it's it's not, you know, the more and more we think we are trying to help everything, the more and more we we create these divides and kind of segregate ourselves into these categories, you know, and then. Now we're fighting against each other again, for real. You know, rather it be with words or whatever. You know, so, you know, that's, that's pretty much it.